Hi, my name is Jessica Ramirez. On behalf of Bill Potter today, I'm chatting with David Lamont from CSL. CSL is the world's leading supplier of blood plasma therapies, number two in flu vaccines and almost the biggest company on the ASX. David Lamont, thank you so much for your time. Pleasure to be here. So first up, congratulations. A great set of uh, half-year numbers, uh, growth in all key metrics, half-year net profit up 11%, um, blood plasma growth making up the bulk of your revenue, 85%. Um, so tell us what's fueling this and what will it take to go to new levels and what are the other new regions you're going to? Yeah, look, thanks for the question. Firstly, let's just say the underlying industry dynamics are seeing upward tick in demand. So we anticipate that the industry today is growing at around about seven to nine percent for our key products in Emilia Goblins. So our IG franchise continues to be the main part of growth. And that's largely coming on the back of continued better diagnostics that we're seeing in the industry. The fact that we actually have an aging population and therefore as people age, their immune system becomes more compromised and they need some assistance. And we're also seeing good growth in what we call secondary immune deficiency, which is largely coming on the back of the new wave of oncology products that are hitting the market, whereby for those products to work, your immune system needs to actually be um, decreased so that the cancerous cells can be attacked by the new wave of oncology products. And then pretty quickly after that treatment, you get a boost back with your immune system by taking IG. So we see the overall growth in the industry now around about 9%. Um, I, as the market leader, we intend to grow ahead of that. So our ambition is to continue to grow market share, and we do that by continuing to source the precious raw ingredient that we need, which is plasma. And you're also paving a rapid expansion into new markets overseas. Tell us about that. Yeah, so we now sell into 72 countries around the globe. Um, the US continues to be the, the growth engine though, so half of our sales or just over half of our sales are in the US, but we continue to actually put product into areas across the world whereby patients are needing our forms of therapy. So 72 countries now that we actually operate in, uh, which is a, a critical part of underpinning the overall growth. We do see that outside the US, the per capita usage for our key products is less, so there is certainly runway there. And so something that you touched on before was um, this huge demand for liquid gold, uh, blood plasma. So shortage of supply, but huge demand. So are blood plasma products, is this a sustainable business? What's fueling growth as well? Yeah, so it's a good question. The first thing just to say is this is an industry that everybody knows what everybody's doing. So by nature, as I sort of say, we're not going to roll out, out of bed one day and suddenly find a disruptive form of therapy there because people need to run clinical trials. And so we have a good view as to what's coming from the, within the industry that might be a disruptive therapy. We're also in that place as well, so looking what, what's out there. So the fundamentals are still about that underlying growth for the three key areas of IG use, which is, as I mentioned earlier, primary immune deficiency, secondary immune deficiency, and a neurological uh, indication called CIDP. That equates for around about 70 to 75% of the overall IG use. And every one of those key areas continues to grow. To do that, as you mentioned earlier, uh, I think you said liquid gold, we don't see the plasma quite like that, but you've got to collect plasma to actually make these forms of therapy. Um, and that's where we're leading the industry. We're opening 40 centres this year, um, and the rest of the industry is struggling to keep up with underlying market demand. So as you mentioned, uh, you're not exactly going to roll out of bed one day and find that there's new competitors on your doorstep. You, you are the world leader, but we can't ignore the fact that, you know, there are some people really trying to catch up to you. What are these emerging technologies? What do they look like? And how are you future-proofing the business? Some of the disruptive potential threats to the business are at least three to five years away if they're successful. And we're in that space as well. So the one that gets a fair bit of focus is gene therapy. Um, and we're looking at that. Um, that is an area that medical science has been looking at for a long period of time, but to date has not been able to actually create a product. But we're in that space. We recently did an acquisition of a company called Calimune, uh, which is looking initially at sickle cell. So it's a platform that we've actually acquired 
And if that does prove up, then it potentially has application for other areas within our portfolio. So we're in that space. We're very mindful of others that are in that space, um, watching what's there. But this is heavy research and development. There is no guarantee of success uh, as part of that. So we're just cautiously watching what's actually out there. The other area that people do talk about in the industry uh, is also around, um, again, into the neurological side of the IG use, which is FCRNs, as they're known, which is a different form of um, approach to the, the disease state. We're also in that area with our own research side of things. So we have recently told the market that we're going to spend between 10 and 11 per cent of our sales on research and development. That's a step up from historical levels closer to sort of 8 per cent. And part of that's to look at some of these disruptive areas and also have our toe into that water. Um, so we think we've got a good portfolio looking at new indications for existing products that we have as well as looking at some disruptors. So you've had a bumper half year on the back of, um, I guess, flu pressures in the, in the Northern Hemisphere. So tell us about what's uh, driving growth in your flu vaccines market. Yeah, so when we bought the business of, from Novartis to form Securus, we actually said what we were looking to do at that point was to shift from unprofitable products to more profitable products and maintain market share. And in simple terms, what we were able to do is take what used to be a historical vaccine, which was known as a trivalent, whereby you'd have three strains in the vaccine, to a quadrivalent product, which has four strains in the, the vaccine, and as a result of that gets a higher price. And we've been successful in doing that transition. Over and above that, we also have two products that are differentiated into the market. The first one is flu cell vax, and our operation in Holly Springs, we were able to scale up, and it is the only scale cell-based technology in the world. And we therefore make a vaccine directly from cell, not going through the more traditional approach whereby the vaccines are made through eggs. Real world evidence today is showing that that vaccine has a better effectiveness. Um, so we think that that's a, a position that gives us a competitive advantage into the market. The other one's our product called Fluad, uh, and this is targeted at the over 65s. And when people age, their immune system um, decays, and so the vaccine needs a little bit of help to work. And we have what's known as MF59, which is an adjuvant that we put with the antigen uh, that is a single shot. And our major competitor in that space gives four times the antigen volume. So we again think that we have a, a better product into that market. So product shifts from trivalent to quadrivalent and then having in the quadrivalent space the only cell based and in the adjuvanted space or in the elderly, the only adjuvanted product is giving us a price position um, that has meant the business has turned around. Staying on vaccines, CSL is doing a bit of a collaboration. So the University of Queensland are uh, developing potentially a vaccine to fight the coronavirus. Um, is this uh, of benefit to the business and what other collaborations have you got underway and um, what else can we see in this space? Yeah, so let me just say up front that what we're doing at the moment with the University of Queensland is largely on humanitarian grounds as opposed to commercial grounds. Um, the coronavirus is a very serious event. We actually have 600 people in China that work for CSL, so the first thing that we wanted to ensure was the safety of our employees, and, and thankfully um, today I can report that we don't have anyone within our business that actually has contracted the virus, so that, that's a key, key focus for us. We have a long-standing relationship with the University of Queensland, and so when they're looking at developing the vaccine, we actually uh, are assisting them by offering the use of some of our labs, um, offering uh, assistance through some of our research um, team, and also we have offered them the use of our MF59, the adjuvanted product, if that would be useful in the development of ultimately a, a vaccine that might go into the elderly. I will say to you, though, the World Health Organisation has actually come out and said that it's probably 18 months away before a vaccine will be developed. Now, hopefully it's quicker than that, but that is what um, has been the, the basis in the past. If you look at things like Ebola, you look at things like SARS, no vaccine even has been developed to today. Um, so, you know, we wish the, the University of Queensland all the best in their pursuits and we're looking to help them. 
but as I said earlier, more on a humanitarian basis rather than on a um, commercial basis. And just lastly, David, before we let you go, you've upgraded your full year guidance for the full FY20 financial year. Net profit after tax now tipped to be $2.1 to $2.17 billion. That's 10 to 13% higher than the same time last year. So what's going to be the real big catalyst to drive growth to unparalleled heights? Yeah, so let me start by saying when we came into the year for FY20, we gave guidance of a 7 to 10% increase in net profit after tax. And as a result of the half year and the strength that we saw in the half year, we have increased that to, as you said, 10 to 13% net profit after tax growth. Principally behind that is some of the factors that we've seen in the first half. So the stronger IG demand across the business, the good strength that we're seeing in the securest business as well, uh, which at this stage we'd expect to be a little bit above the previous guidance that we did have of around about 200 million earnings before interest and tax. We think we'll probably do a little bit better than that. So there's a multitude of factors that have actually come through. Also the fact that in our hereditary angioedema space, our product Haygarda, we have been a little bit limited by supply and we do have a new train that is actually just has been approved by the FDA. So we'll be back in the market with that um, and competing pretty strongly in that space. So a number of factors, it's never just one item that actually makes the difference in, in any of these sorts of upgrades. But we're in a fortunate position that the underlying demand for our products remains strong and that's underpinning the, the upgrade that we've seen. Well, congratulations on your exceptional results and thank you so much for your time. Appreciate that, thanks very much. For more information, head over to Bell Potter's website or contact your advisor.